Hey gang, I thought now that we would uh, kind of got the game on update out of the way, I want to talk about uh, the Third World War from GDW, the Frank Chadwick game that came out in 84, and a couple of modules, modules after that, uh, I think 86 was the last one, and talk to you about my experience with it and how, you know, what I, what I, what I think of the game. I certainly had a fantastic time with the title. Uh, it was a very entertaining experience, and I think that was a uh, lot to do with the person I was playing with. It made it uh, very enjoyable. Uh, there was no uh, shortage of uh, verbal abuse uh, flung in all directions, both uh, at each other and uh, at the dice and at the counters, and at the circumstances and at the rules. So <clears throat> the game uh, itself, the, the big picture is you know, the World War, hence the title. Uh, <laughs> And really tries to take in the full uh, the full aspect of everything from the Persian Gulf through the southern uh, parts of Turkey and the Mediterranean all the way up through to the, the Nordic countries. And we didn't use the Nordic maps, but we did uh, we did use the obviously the Central Front, Southern Front, and the Persian Gulf uh, modules. Okay. I've had. Uh, Few people tell me that you know this game really is a, all about the air war and it's all about how the air war plays out and it's more of an air war game than it is a war game and i was very dismissive of that because you know surely that would have come out from more than just a couple of people if that was the case and uh so i was fairly dismissive of that and i've probably uh probably it's probably an accurate statement in that the air war is vital to both sides if it's not played correctly. But it's not the whole game, which is the good news. And <clears throat> and in fact, it, it, there's a naval game there as well it's, that's abstracted, but we can talk about that perhaps later or some other time. Oh, and by the way, pop a comment in right now if you want to see all the components and have the maps laid out and you know do a little showcase of the bits and pieces and have it set up and stuff because I am looking to set it up again and play it solo probably won't play all three uh, modules together but I will play them discreetly uh, so if you do want to see some uh, video and counter pictures and things like that I'm happy to do that but pop a comment in and so let's talk about the game and the game mechanics. It was interesting with this air war, actually. It reminds me, or perhaps it's the other way around, that Next War Korea, Next War Taiwan, remind me of uh, GDW's uh, Third World War air war that's, that's in the rules are in it. Uh, clean, pretty clean, pretty streamlined. Uh, the Next War one is a little bit more involved, perhaps, than this. But this, this particular system, uh, the GDW system from Chadwick, has just a, a, a wonderful clean and concise way of doing things. So you have a phase that allows you to uh, go through and do deep strikes, so trying to affect runways and affect logistics, which is in effect just simply putting units out of supply. <coughs> and uh, cratering runways is fun because it uh, mitigate, it, it grounds units and destroys units that were caught on the ground. Simple die roll. Uh, so whatever the, the, the dice are that you roll for the units that do the strike, you get to uh, you get to um, uh, add those add those numbers up, and you do some math, and it works out that that's your. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm kind of getting distracted here. That's your uh, that's your cratering number for the specific area that you are focused on. So, given the, the turns over a week, and you're sending a fleet of B-52s or a fleet of you know. Yeah, whatever F-18s or medium-range bombers or whatever they may be, uh, it's kind of trying to take into effect that you're going and hitting multiple targets, and then the obviously the enemy can try and intercept those things as well. So it's very cool. Logistics is looking at uh, you know perhaps uh, you know consecutive raids over a period of time and the course of a week. You know how much damage did you do to the rail and transport network to interfere with uh, supplies and reinforcements and replenishment and things like that. And uh, that ends up with a number of, uh, you know, the dice, whatever the dice are rolled from the ground strike rating uh, on the unit, uh, or airstrike, whatever it is, the strike number on the unit, uh, you that's that's totaled up and divided by two, 
and that's going to be your number of, div of brigades that are going to be put out supply. So really straightforward. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the Soviet players or the NATO players going to make a really hard choice. Okay, is this frontline unit going to be put out of supply? Or will I put these guys that are kind of hanging out in the back, uh, put them out of supply that I was perhaps going to use for a breakthrough move? Or will I put frontline units out of supply that have taken some damage and then roll those guys back off the line and put those new guys in early. So there's some real uh, interesting choices that have to be made when you uh, inflict these logistical uh, strikes on people. So very cool. So that's just one aspect. That's one phase of a turn. You do that every turn at the very beginning and then you go through the sequence of play, which is asynchronous, and you have uh, uh, three, basically three uh, Warsaw Pact phases with one uh, reserve impulse phase for NATO. And then NATO gets to have two impulses uh, back to back uh, to have their turn. And in each one of those phases, there is, you're eligible to conduct uh, ground support for an attack or defense, uh, intercepting of those ground support uh, things, uh, and then also you can do ground attacks as well. We have two different numbers on the on the unit that uh, give you the appropriate attack factor. So when you're setting up your air, you've really got to think about what I want to try and achieve, achieve this turn. Uh, am I going to be atta proactively attacking as the NATO player? Because in the Soviet turn, I can ground do ground strikes against his units and try to preemptively uh, put some disruptions on his forces, which would then, you know, weaken his attack. So that could be important. Or do I want to save my uh, warthogs, for instance, and keep them for a defensive uh, situation that I'm going to, I know I'm going to need to defend the, the fall of the gap or whatever the case might be. So I'm going to hold back that, uh, that, that specific unit to keep, keep him safe and I may uh, use, keep an interceptor uh, to protect that unit as well. <clears throat> and that's where the whole air superiority game comes into play. So this is going to be we, we may just talk about the air war <laughs> in this video, or otherwise we're going to we're going to crash through ten minutes pretty easily. So, uh, air superiority at the very beginning of the game turn, uh, the Soviet player puts up all of his air units that he wants to put into air superiority, typically interceptor style forces, and uh, then the NATO player makes his decision. Hey, do I want to do I want to do that? Do I want to match him, or do I want to do more? And if you do more, it gives you air superiority. Now, if you, and so if you have air superiority, that means when you do do an intercept, you can put more than one aircraft on that intercept. Ideally, two aircraft on that intercept. No more than two, though. <clears throat> very simple, very small thing, but what that does is if you don't have air superiority, uh, you're, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage when you do want to try and intercept something that's uh, perhaps a, a critical, on a critical part of the battlefield, in that given air region, there's three or four air regions. Excuse me, three or four air regions in the campaign. So, you've got air superiority. You, you may just put one more unit up than he does, or two more units up. But that can often be a big number. In one game I played, I put had to put 21 aircraft up. So that uh, that sucks away a lot of the ability for the NATO player to react uh, to the circumstances that are presented to him in every Warsaw Pact phase with their ground attacks and their uh, uh, offensive attacks on your units. You've got, all of a sudden, you have no way to intercept. You can intercept. You can intercept. But you can't react and counter and put additional aircraft on to mitigate odds losses and things like that. So all the units that go into air superiority end up being available for intercept actions. So that's good but it's pulling units out of your available pool to allow you to conduct ground strikes or defensive missions uh, or offensive miss missions if you're doing an attack. Uh, so that's, that makes things, makes you really think about what it is you want to achieve in the turn and how you want to counter and counteract your opponent's actions and make those hard choices. Am I going to support this particular unit or not support this particular unit? Where is he going to attack this turn? Is he going all in with ground strikes and air, and air strikes on, uh, on the combats uh, and the, the, uh, trying to soften up units before a combat? Or is he putting everything into deep strikes? And so deep strikes are going to give you a little bit of an indication of what your opponent is probably going to try to achieve in a given turn. If he puts a whole lot of act action on 
the deep strike phase, you know, doing logistical and uh, cratering runs, you know, you you have an opportunity to. Uh, you've already committed your air superiority, but you have an opportunity then, if he's overcommitted on any either of those, to aggressively strike back with your air in your ground strike and air strike uh, phase. I'm probably using the wrong terminology. It's probably not air strike. Let me just check this here. What do they actually call it? Where is it on the sequence play? Uh, yeah, they just call it strikes and escorts. So, this ground there are, a ground strike is a ground strike, but you can attack a unit before the combat phase, and you can attack a unit in the combat phase. There's two different things, and I can also def use an airstrike to defend in the combat phase. Okay, so that that so that air war. Uh, no, I spent now 10 or 11 minutes talking about it so it is fairly significant but it's only as significant as you make it in the game with the way you conduct conduct your war if you're going to spread your air around and you know uh, pitter patter it across uh, a number of different sectors of the map of a given air zone it's probably going to be diluted right if you concentrate it in a specific area where you happen to have an army or two armies and you want to try and push through, I think it can be very effective in combination with with the ground attack. The air war is not going to win you the war, but it may accelerate the, you the accelerate for you the winning of the war, or it may deaccelerate your attack if your defend if your opponent knows how to use the air the air war efficiently. The movement in combat is very straightforward, very simple. Everyone gets six movement points, makes it a uh, very interesting game from that perspective. Basically, you know, infantry, all units have six movement points, but it's the cost they pay for each hex that's different. So there's two or three columns for mech, uh, armor, infantry, airborne units, and then the terrain chart that lists out what the different movement points costs are for each hex for each different type of unit. And it all works out real simple. It's all very intuitive from that perspective. There is a, a nice little catch too in that you pay to enter and exit zones of control. So once you get in a zone of control, it can be often very difficult to get out of them, particularly if there are those little air mobile units, uh, as they always force you to pay plus two for the entrance and exit of uh, their zone of control, excuse me, versus uh, other units have, uh, you may only have a, a one factor, particularly if you're an armor, uh, armor unit, you can leave an infantry or, mo or mechanized units zone of control, I believe, for just the, the one movement point, additional movement point to the, the cost of the terrain. And terrain also factors into your combat results, obviously, uh, affected as either DRMs or as column shifts, or sometimes, are there any that are both? I don't think there are any that are both. So, how, so what, when you get in, and th th one of the things that probably would uh, be nice to see refreshed would be the combat results table. Very straightforward, you know, 1 to 3 through to 10 to 1. Uh, Attacks are basically risky from three to one to five to one, or from two to one to five to one, because there's an exchange. And as the NATO player, you don't want exchanges. The last thing you want to do when you're attacking is kill the enemy unit and then have to lose your unit as well. Happily take one, two, or three disruptions on your unit. Every unit has an efficiency rating, and once you accrue uh, accrue uh, disruptions equal to your efficiency rating, you're out. Uh, so, efficiency or proficiency, it's one of the two. Uh, and so that kills the unit off. Dead units are dead, and they're gone, and they ain't coming back. Units that are degraded by this proficiency rating being uh, having uh, dings put on it, you can move them to the rear and recover one a turn, or one of impulse, uh, one of your impulses, in one in each of your impulses, assuming you are not adjacent to an enemy unit and you don't move and you don't fight. So that's pretty cool. So the Americans and NATO forces can roll forces in, roll forces out, recover damage and 
be almost be back to full strength. Whereas the Soviets, once they take one, they always keep one uh, disruption. They can recover the rest, and they can also rotate in and rotate out. But it seems that in combat, the efficiency ratings will also move the columns on the CRT based on the delta between the two forces. So if I'm rated a seven, which is what most of the, the U.S. forces are, uh, particularly the U.S. forces, they're all rated seven, and the British are rated uh, eight, and the best Soviet units are rated seven, and then it goes six and five. If there's a two delta on that, that's going to negatively impact your combat results table. So if I'm fighting you at four to one, and I have this, this negative uh, efficiency rating effect, I'm going to have to shift my odds down one uh, on the converse. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm better than you, I'm going to bump my odds up by one. And you take an average of the of the efficiency ratings that you have in your stack that's being attacked or from the attackers that are attacking. So if I've got three stacks and I've got sixes and fives and fours and whatever, all those go together and I may end up with three and a quarter as an average, a little bit of math, uh, versus uh, five and a quarter or six and a quarter or seven and a quarter and if that happens well then those shifts start to make a difference because it goes from one shift to two shifts to three shifts to f I think four shifts is the max. Is four shifts the max? He said quickly looking at the combat chart and not having it in his hand. Ta-da! Four odds levels. Yeah, so if I have six six levels higher than you, um, you, you need to be attacking at eight to one just to get four to one attack. Anyway, so combat works out really well. I like the way it all works, and you accumulate all these little uh, these little pips, and that uh, impacts your efficiency and effectiveness. You can recover those over time. That was the short version of that. Sorry. Uh, that's really the game right there. And then it's all about the terrain and how you manage the terrain and manage moving forces in and out and relieving them and giving them a little bit of a breather and then throwing them back into the breach, sacrificing as many French brigades as you can. Sorry, Frenchies. Uh, perfect units just to throw in there. Uh, you can, they have a strong enough will in their combat, uh, their army, that you can lose five, six, or seven of those guys without affecting their will to fight. So it's another, fa another soft factor in terms of uh, whether a force will be shaken or surrender or not. Uh, so you push these, these shrapnel little uh, regiments and brigades into... Uh, hexes that will force the Soviet player to make, even if it's an eight to one attack, uh, they've got to make the attack and then advance into that hex and then attack you so they don't get two attacks on your stronger units. That's one of the little tricks that I learned uh, last week when we were playing. All right, so long video, 20 minutes. I mean, we're, you're probably bored to death. I'm really thrilled with the game. Uh, obviously can't speak highly enough about it. I would love to see someone redo this. And, and literally lift the entire system and bring it in up to modern uh, map and counter standards, uh, clean up the rules a little bit, and give us a fresh look at not only 80s uh, World War Three, but you know, our current world is pretty interesting right now. And if this is a, indeed a new Cold War or the second Cold War, then we should be... Uh, looking at that as a gaming simulation opportunity to explore what could or might happen. So wouldn't it be fantastic to be able to play out the 80s and then play out the 20, 21st century here and, now, here and now in this decade with uh, the current force mixes that we have all around the world and all the crazy stuff going on. Those three or four map modules would make a fantastic game. Um, anyway, that's just my food for thought. I know that Adam Starkweather has a Doomsday game coming along. Don't think it's the same sort of system here. He's got that chip pull activation thing going again. Uh, and if that all works, great. But if it doesn't, then you know you're 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 buying yourself a whole different ball of wax, and not a game like this. This is a clean, lean fighting machine game that dog hunts like a mofo. It's a really tight game. Probably one of the better game systems I've played in a long time. Uh, so I'll say that much. 
uh, looking forward to getting it, some more experience with it to see if there are any you know structural flaws with it or game flaws with it or ways you can game the game to uh, break uh, either the Soviets or the, the NATO forces quickly. I've heard a few little stories here and there. I know that you can jam lots of air from the Arctic version, Arctic map down into, and all the forces from there down into the central front and just blow away stuff. We played the uh, we played it play it like it's supposed to be played rules and didn't allow massive transfers of units from one air front to another. So, or no forces for that matter. Uh, there you go. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Take it easy.